How are you, Publius? Doing quite well, Mod. How are you? Thanks, Art. Uh, very well here. All right. We can kick off this class with a question from Bacchus. And he asks two questions. We'll start with the first one. Uh, can you describe the Oracle problem that you're working on in preparation for the AMM? And how are you approaching this problem? Sure. So the, the starting point of the problem is that in the post-merge world, constructing an on-chain Oracle that is resistant to multi-block MEV is non-trivial. That's the starting point. And so uh, the current delta B from the B and three curve pool is calculated with a, a basic TWAP. And in short, that is not resistant to multi-block MEV. Now, beyond just multi-block MEV, the goal of building an on-chain Oracle where the price from the Oracle is exclusively a function of on-chain data is to make the Oracle or oracles uh, resistant to as much different, as many different types of manipulation as possible. And so when it comes to what's the, the holdup, well, there's a lot of research being done into the different types of uh, ways to measure the price and not just the different ways to measure them. For example, should you use an arithmetic mean? Should you use a geometric mean? Uh, What's the best way to store the data? Is it is a TWAP better than an EMA type of oracle? There's lots of questions that were. There's a lot of research being done into what are the different types of oracles that can be implemented in a relatively gas efficient fashion on chain, and then what types of manipulation are each of those oracles resistant to? And then it's a question of well, can you construct? Well, then there's two questions. the The next question is, can you construct gas efficient on-chain oracles that are pretty flexible such that other protocols can also use these on-chain oracles in a permissionless fashion so they're really easy for others to use as well and they're not just hard-coded oracles for specific uses but they're more generalized can that be done in a gas efficient fashion and then sort of the ultimate question is how do you design an aggregate oracle such that the the, the read, an on-chain read that is constructed from perhaps an aggregate of a variety of different oracles that are resistant to different types of manipulation, that ultimately you can get some sort of value that is derived exclusively from on-chain data in a gas-efficient fashion that is generally manipulation-resistant uh, because of the fact that it, it is actually comprised of a variety of different oracles that are each individually resistant to various types of manipulation. So the, the short answer is, uh, in order to try to get the on-chain oracles right, uh, such that this can be used on a variety of different things going forward, we think it makes sense to try to do most of the homework and legwork now and get the oracles done right now, such that uh, in the future, everything else can just start to run on top of these oracles, assuming that they, they turn out to be generally manipulation resistant. So that's, that's the problem in a nutshell. Uh, is the source of the price uh, also taken into consideration? And um, by that, I mean, uh, for instance, when we had a bean uh, ETH pool, we used to read the ETH USDC uh, um, pool as a reference. Um, is that taken into consideration? Where are you reading or referencing the price as well? Yes. So... At the end of the day, the hope is to have a similar to the way that the original Beanstalk Oracle was constructed, where you've got some leg to Ethereum, where you're pricing Ethereum in dollars, and then you can price everything against Ethereum. The hope is to have at some point uh, an ETH USDC and an ETH USDT and an ETH DAI, maybe an ETH LUSD, lots of different pairs trading in wells uh, with, with very low or zero fees, probably zero fees. The question is whether or not the silo needs to incentivize liquidity in those pools, even though they don't have bean exposure, such that Beanstalk can derive a relatively manipulation-resistant price for Ethereum, and then everything else can be derived off of that. So there is still a, a, 
a fundamental question of where to get the price of a dollar per se. Uh, but, but the hope is that if you have an on-chain Oracle that is sufficiently generalized and resistant to general manipulation, again, not, not really a well-defined term at this point, but we're still in the research phase. The hope is that you'll be able to do all of this without any single points of, of centralization or, or potential censorship. And if we're considering multiple sources, uh, would then the depth or the size of these pools also uh, play you know, a role into, into the Oracle? That is certainly one thing that's being looked into. Uh, the, in, in practice, there's actually likely going to be a variety of different styles of Oracle. Uh, it, depth is less meaningful when it comes to taking an immediate price. Uh, but it is more meaningful when trying to come up with liquidation prices, for example. So if these wells are ultimately going to be used for CDPs or other derivatives such that liquidation is required, then the liquidation value of any given position in a well would certainly be a function of depth. So figuring out how to factor depth into these oracles is another part of the problem. Yeah, and I see, I mean... You've mentioned at least four or five things that require a lot of a lot of depth or a lot of research into it, um, and, and I just wanted to highlight how you know complex this this oracle problem or um, or the oracle in general is, and we look, we look forward to tackling all of these and seeing it eventually, hopefully coming out in Q4 of this year. All right, the second question from Bacchus is. He, he asks and he says, there seems to be somebody purchasing a negligible amount of soil every season so that the temperature rises by 1% instead of 3%. And that is slowing down the price discovery you know, for soil. Doesn't this indicate a problem with the soil demand measurement? Since you know, less than one bean sown when delta B is around 350,000 is being considered medium demand. Wouldn't it be better to use uh, you know, something else? And he proposes a solution that is a gradient where you look into the amount of soil that was unsold season over season. Yes, this is clearly an, an inefficiency at best in the measurement for soil and, or measurement of demand for soil. And I think the, the grading idea is certainly interesting and one we hadn't considered. Uh, something that was more of a quick fix to this would be something like if less than half of the soil is not sown, then the weather continues to go up. Uh, but there's, there's a couple different ways to try to get around this. But uh, generally, yeah, this is, this is certainly an efficiency in the measurement for demand for soil that's on display here. And, and Publius, do you think this is in general problematic? So what if the price discovery takes time, um, you know, for it for it to be? If it's one percent instead of three percent, and it takes longer, is is this a problem in general? Well, it's not a problem per se. In general, beanstalk isn't in a rush to return the bean price to the peg at any given time. But nonetheless, that's a different thing than currently minimal bean summer season, and a single entity can significantly affect the way that beanstalk is changing its temperature. And so from our perspective, they're really two separate questions. One is, what should beanstalk be changing the temperature based on the data? And then the second question is how to measure the data in order to answer the former question as accurately as possible. But this seems to be a problem with the latter question, which is that the measure of demand for soil seems to be pretty inaccurate at the moment. All right. The second question comes um, from from Terraboy. Um, and that may be a, a little bit of the same um, idea or the same line of thinking that Nasdaq um, dropped in the, uh, in the, in the ideas uh, channel. And, and that is, you know, should all uh, participants still receive seniorage? So, so let's read the question. Hindsight is 20 out of 20. I'm a believer of being on the protocol, but I'm starting to question how good the DAO was to holders before exploit specifically pod holders taking no haircuts and unripe holders still receiving seniorage. Do you think that all participants you know, are to receive um, um, being seniorage or not? And Nasdaq's idea was that all participants you know, should not receive uh, being seniorage until, I'm actually not sure until when, but in general, he thinks that you know, don't, they shouldn't be receiving being seniorage. Well, it, there's a couple things. One... In general, you know, we'd prefer to comment on things like this if there's 
reasons for it, if that makes sense. Like the question is just that they're raising whether or not the pod holders taking no haircuts and unripe holders still receiving seniorage is a good idea. I think it's easier to respond to specific logic than just to make a, a, a high level statement about this is good or this is bad. Uh, not also not exactly sure where the sentiment is coming from. Uh, from our perspective, this isn't something that we give much thought to. Think that the that the protocol is in a pretty healthy spot moving forward, and don't not really focused on the past at all. So, just haven't really haven't thought about it, and the fact that there's not a lot of uh, reasoning or, or, or points specifically to address in this question makes it a little hard to to address specifically. But from our perspective, uh, you know, nothing really to say on this front. Okay. Maybe I can build up a little bit uh, on that. And I think there is some sort of thinking on, you know, the current liquidity uh, that is uh, un- uh, that is vested, let's say, uh, or unvested, uh, which are unripe uh, assets, um, who owns it? Uh, and some think that, you know, uh, those who purchase fertilizers, they are the ones who own it uh, and not, and not the, the unripe well, holders. Well, that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. So, you know, it's, there's, there's, I mean, there's, there's good, there's good ideas and there's bad ideas. The idea that the people that purchase the fertilizer still own the USDC that they use to purchase the fertilizer is ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, that, that's an easy one to, to substantively respond to. That's not, that's like a, I I don't even know how to respond to such a thing. Okay. All right. Maybe we can move a little bit to some questions about uh, governance and reminding everyone there are five proposals that are right now out. But, uh, maybe just to, to harp on that a little bit. When you sure. purchase debt in general, any from anyone in any case, whether it's a protocol, whether it's a bank, you now own the debt. You do not still own the capital that you use to purchase the debt. The concept that you own the debt, the bond, whatever you want to call it, and still own the capital it's just ridiculous. Agreed. And, and the owners right now are the unripe holders, given that they are the ones who issued uh, that debt. And Fertil- you know- Fertilizer was a debt issuance. The, the, the way that the USDC was going to be used from the fertilizer sales was very clear. Uh, so the concept that I mean, it's just ridiculous. All right. We move, we move to some governance um, questions. Um, and again, reminding everyone that we have five uh, current proposals uh, that are out there for voting, um, and, and we can we can ask some questions. And I guess this comes back again, you know, to maybe voter voter fatigue. And there are some ideas on how to maybe counter that. I'm just gonna check who asked. That was Chris. So Chris proposes or or thinks that you know, what if we add a weighted vote system where everyone starts at 100% and then depending on you know how often you vote your vote voting power reduces and then if you come back and you're voting again you you go back again to your, you know 100% of your voting power so let's say you know you, you have uh, 100 100 beans they give you 100 stock you don't vote you know t- 10 times in a row so now only 50 uh, of your 100 stock are eligible for voting. If you vote back again, you get back again all of your 100, 100 stock. And, and the idea is that this brings down you know, the quorum uh, needed uh, to pass votes. Well, first off, the governance system for Beanstalk was designed, and I know at this point it's easy to laugh at because it was ultimately attacked, but it was designed such that Beanstalk is very difficult to change. If the goal is for Beanstalk to be the issuer of money, it cannot be that it's easy to change the nature of that money or to mint arbitrarily new amounts of that money. So in general, we think it's probably better than not that it's hard to pass BIPs. And the fact that there's friction and a close vote, it's very healthy from our perspective. It should not be that uh, it's, it's, it's easy to change Beanstalk. Now, with that said, there really is something unique about the nature of Beanstalk as a DAO because it does hold value in it. And there is some, some, some aspect of 
if you look at Ethereum, for example, w- w- when there's a, a, a dissent, when there are two different parties that have different ideas for how the protocol pr- should proceed, there's a fork very often. And the result is that there's a fragmentation of value and there's a split. And in the case of Beanstalk, the goal is really as much as possible to prevent a split. Now, at the end of the day, maybe it makes sense for for the governance system to be a little bit closer to an L1 system where you have bean forks that arise based on participation in BIPs. And in doing so, you can have the competition between the two models, and therefore you can have some sort of unity amongst the people that continue to use a given version of Beanstalk, but think that it's probably better to have the DAO remain a single collective and and and, and try to try to implement things as a single unit as opposed to constantly fork it. But this is kind of a theoretical discussion that I think should be fleshed out a little bit more. And as the governance system around Beanstalk increases in sophistication. For example, there may be a delegation that's added at some point. Uh, it's unclear whether it's unclear what the best way to, to have the DAO run itself is, particularly when there are close votes. And the other thing is, well, you, you may have, particularly as Beanstalk grows in regular use, and you have less active members in the DAO, maybe it is that, that you do need to vote against propositions as opposed to ab- abstaining, counting as a vote against. In the, if we go back to where we started answering this question about how it's important that it's hard for Beanstalk to change, that's why it, it currently abstentions are counted as dissenting votes. But perhaps there's a significant portion of the DAO that is simply not engaged in voting. Therefore, it's very hard to actually get to a 50% quorum. And if we go back to how when an L1 splits, even your passive users, they, can, they, they just hold both of the forks and then your slightly more active participants, they can sell one fork for the other. There is, there is something to be said for DAO members being able to more actively assert what how they'd like Beanstalk to change, but it really does need to be balanced against Beanstalk changing too much or too quickly or too easily. So not sure that this is a particularly constructive answer, but a lot can a lot can be done to further improve Beanstalk governance, but not sure we agree that that there's there is necessarily an inherent problem per se. Okay. The other uh, proposal mentioned uh, is maybe something that we discussed before, which is being bribes or bribing, you know, people to vote um, on governance proposals. Uh, and the question is, what, what do you think about that? Do you elaborate what that means? So maybe something similar um, to how Curve uh, uh, works, where you know um, there is a proposal out there, and and we allow people to bribe uh, or pay stockholders in order to vote, you know, or sway their votes one way or another. Maybe it becomes an incentive for them to also like vote. So at the end of the day, Vitalik's written about this. There's nothing that can really be done to prevent such a market from arising for using governance tokens and therefore it's it's probably inevitable that there becomes some sort of market for stock particularly to be used in certain bips uh but not sure that that needs to be a focus of the beanstalk governance system as much as just a consideration that that is likely to exist in some capacity and therefore, the governance system needs to be aware of it and resistant to, as, as resistant as possible to manipulation that can come from uh, people lending out their voting power. Okay. Um, 
the next the next question is we we go back and uh, visit an idea from last that was brought up last week uh, by Bacchus as well, which is rebalancing seeds for unripe assets. And and the the thought last week was what if we remove them completely or change them basically you know for for unripe holders. And there has been uh, some some discussion uh, going back and forth on it. And Publius did share uh, their technical um, um, opinion or input as well um, to that. I'm not sure, Publius, if, if you followed up uh, through it, but I wanted to see if, if you have any ideas uh, or any thoughts uh, on, on that proposal. So from our perspective, it certainly doesn't make sense to remove seeds entirely from unripe assets. I uh, think that it's generally beneficial to, to retain the integrity of the stock system as closely as possible because of its efficacy from a, an incentive perspective thus far at least, and not sure that getting rid of the seeds for unripe assets is really going to help Beanstalk in any way. What does seem to be reasonable is potentially lowering the seeds for the unripe LP uh, as opposed to raising the beans for the unripe LP to make them closer together. Don't really think it makes sense for the unripe beans to have a higher seed for BDB than the normal beans. That seems weird. So think that the, the most reasonable way to do this would be to lower the, the seeds per unripe LP. Now, that would require... It, it's just not the most trivial thing to do. In the last class, we spoke that it was probably pretty trivial it is generally trivial but it would require uh an update to all of the deposits that are stored on chain that are unripe lp that have a a bdv a, a, a unripe lp seed ratio of four that would have to be lowered to three so there is some cost associated with doing that uh but it, it could certainly be done so from our perspective if someone wanted to go ahead and try to implement that we'd obviously be as always uh willing to help out but uh not sure that's uh w what we intend to spend our time on over the next couple of weeks but certainly makes sense uh for someone to implement so Publius, I, I have two questions um and the first is why treat unripe assets differently from from ripe assets why why do unripe lp receive less um than, than ripe ones and I'll ask, I'll ask the second question uh, after that, after the first. I think I lost you there for a minute. The Wi-Fi. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Sorry, the Wi-Fi went out. Where did, I, where did I lose you? Um, just at the end of the question, so you, you can answer it from the beginning. And remind me of the question. Sorry, Mod. Yeah. Why, why treat unripe assets differently from ripe ones? So why, why should unripe assets receive less seeds you know, than, than new, new deposits or, or ripe ones? Sure. So the, the general concept is that this is a, a rough and short, like a short-term rough intermediate step prior to the implementation of an on-chain gauge system. Uh, where you have some sort of automatically adjusting seeds per BDV. And the, the reason to implement something in the short term, even though generally we're not fans of that, is just because of the complexity of upgrading the silo to a gauge system where you have some sort of adjusting seeds per BDV. And currently, you have a significant amount of unripe LP and unripe beans relative to ripe LP and ripe beans. and it seems like there's some friction around converting unripe LP to unripe beans. I guess in theory, there's also friction around converting LP to beans, uh, but the outsized amount of unripe assets makes it more of a problem there. Now, there might be an argument, I think is what you're implying, Mod, to change the seeds per BDV to three for each of the LP tokens, uh, unripe and ripe, and not sure that that's a bad idea either, although it's less obviously helpful to Beanstalk given the circumstances. Okay. And the second, the second thought, and this is something to consider even after implementing the gauge system, which is when do we have a difference in seeds between LP uh, and beans? 
So the idea uh, with, for more seeds uh, for LP uh, LPs uh, versus bean holders is that you know beanstalk wants to incentivize or or uh, move towards a higher liquidity uh, um, um, in, in the silo or in beanstalk. So why not only have the difference uh, when the price of beans is above one, but when it's below one, there is no difference in seeds between them. So, you know, I, I am an LP holder. I have four seeds. When the price is above one, now I only have two seeds. When it goes back below one, it goes back to four seeds. Uh, sorry, when it goes back b uh, above one, then, you know, I go back again to four seeds. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, certainly something that should be considered as the stock system is uh or the, the gauge system for stock is designed it makes a lot of sense okay all right um i'm at the end uh, of the questions uh th that i've picked up from from the past week maybe we can give it a minute or two uh, for others uh, to have any other questions uh from today's uh, the current discussion or you know um, if you have other ones that that weren't addressed and you didn't mention them Okay, a few ones that we can maybe take quickly. Harry Smith asks, um, when is the updated expected Wells BIP date? That remains to be Q4, but probably uh, feel free if you have an update from your end. Uh, we're, from our perspective, that's really the main focus. So trying to get that ready for audit as soon as possible, but are still in the, the research phase. So it's the beginning of Q4. Time is moving pretty slowly, we would say, right? Beanstalk was replanted less than two months ago. I feel like there's a lot of stuff happening at this point. So don't think it's unreasonable to ha try to have that BIP proposed by the end of the year. I think that's a reasonable goal, but, you know, no promises. Okay. The second question comes from Mio Mio, and he asks, do we know if Root will be buying up any soil um, when it launches? Mr. Manifold is not with us, but generally speaking, the ans his answer is there is no comment on how Root will, will use their, their capital. And Publius, again, if you have any, anything from your end, please let us know. I was going to say the same, that I, I generally you know, think Manifold is not inclined to disclose how Root is managing their assets. Okay, I'll give it, um, give it some time as, uh, again, if others have questions before I move to, to something else, let's see. I see Cthulhu typing, so we'll wait and take that question. We have a question from Publius, and that is, when is there going to be a new roadmap? So a couple people reached out to us recently and were wondering when, if ever, there's going to be an updated roadmap and thought that it would be reasonable to talk about it a little bit here. So in general, at this point, think Beanstalk is at the point where there's very clear things that need to get done, but also... There's a lot of open ideas that anyone can present what needs to get done. So from our perspective, we think that it probably it probably makes sense. And we'll we'll try to coordinate with Beanstalk Farms and coordinate with uh I mean anyone that's interested, but at some point we will probably try to publish uh sort of wh where we see things going and what we think should be built or could be built and try to articulate it as best as possible. I think we're still just internally, we're very hesitant to put stuff out there when it feels like it's still just changing so much. And other than sort of the, the obvious immediate things that are the next six to 12 months of work, let's call it, that have already been well laid out, we're a little bit hesitant to rush into saying what we think are the, 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 the big things that need to get worked on and how to do them. So we're, at least on our end, we're not in a rush to put out a roadmap, but it's something that we we find that we naturally are just constantly working on because we're thinking about 
beanstalk all the time and are trying our best to just write things down more and more. So at some point we hope to publish something or work with beanstalk farms to publish something, but still not quite there yet. But, uh, enough people had reached out to us about this that we felt uh, it, it would be reasonable to, to mention. Thank you for that. Uh, definitely is a question that is um, constantly asked and look forward to, to that roadmap uh, being out. And Cthulhu had some kind words uh, about the class and he said that now he can see how better to build um, you know, things on top of Beanstalk and we definitely look forward to that. And if you have any ideas, uh, you can come up to the stage and, 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 and say them or bring them up or uh, man, uh, write them in the Beanstalk Ideas uh, channels as well. With that, maybe we can move um, to, to something else, uh, Publius, and that is the Business Ideas channel uh, that is, you know, recently uh, has been there and, and we had a few uh, ideas in there. And I thought that maybe we can use some time of today's class to, to discuss some of them, you know, just in a light, light-spirited way. Um, how do we think, you know, what are these ideas and maybe how can they uh, benefit being stuck, let's say, um, uh, in general? Starting off with one um, from Safi. And that is about um, um, uh, Aroska. And Aroska is a rotating savings and credit association. Not sure if uh, you're familiar uh, with it, uh, uh, Publius, but generally speaking, the idea of it is that, let's say we have 10 people. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Let's say we have 10 people, and um, each one has $1,000. Uh, so these 10 people come together, and every month, they send that money to someone um, and said, you know, um, um, instead of having there be any, any loans or any interest uh, in it. And then every month, you just pass it and keep on giving it you know, to, someone, to someone else until the, end, until the end of the duration. So 10 people, 10 months. Um, every month, someone receives ten thousand uh, dollars if it's a thousand each, and just rotates uh, in 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 that in that way or other. So it's like come together and form your own bank, and you know su supply people or or provide people just based on internal trust uh, amongst each other. First of all, does this make sense? And then, do you think this adds any any benefit uh, to the beanstalk ecosystem? I think you could implement it without trust, in the sense that people can commit their deposits to a pool. And therefore, you can do it in a trustless fashion. Not sure how much utility there is to have this implemented at the moment, but think that it's a cool, it's cool, and certainly not going to poo poo it as an idea to implement and use beans or deposits to facilitate that, uh, the Ruska. But uh, don't think it's the highest leverage thing to build on top of Beanstalk at the moment. Yeah. And I think uh, something with that generally is, is scalability. It's typically done uh, in, like, let's say, smaller communities or more of the ones that are, uh, you know, less privileged, let's say, commu communities that you would they would come together and help help each other instead of having to deal, you know, with with the rent seeking or or with with banks that charge interest rates. Okay, the second one is pulled together, but for the silo. So a group of Side of depositors come together and they'd be like, hey, one of us is going to win, you know, whatever um, um, seniorage uh, is, deposit, uh, is, is accrued from all of our accounts. Yeah, I think this is similar to the Rosco, which is that it's cool, it's fun, it's another thing to do with your beans, but it's not really utility or it's not going to facilitate the adoption of beans or beanstalk by businesses. So if, if the question is how to create real utility for beans, think that the starting point is more uh, derivatives and ways that businesses will be able to borrow and lend money to one another and uh, manage their treasuries within Beanstalk in such a way such that they have the right exposure for their business. So uh, derivatives in a more sophisticated financial uh, DeFi ecosystem built on top of Beanstalk, that's probably where to start as opposed to these I don't want to call them games per se, but they're more, uh, z they're zero sum. Okay. The last one uh, that I wanted to discuss is uh, from Nasdaq, and that is an NFT marketplace integration, or maybe it can be native uh, uh, to be in stock. But the idea is that typically when people bet, uh, uh, sorry, not bet, um, when they bid uh, for, for an NFT, you lock, you know, your, um, um, the capital that you're bidding with, uh, something similar to even in the pod marketplace when you're bidding, you're you're locking, you know, that uh, that bid of yours. So 
if we are using, um, if there's an integration with Beanstalk or you're using solid deposits to bid, then while all of that bidding is happening or that duration is happening, you're accruing uh, seniorage. So the same of what Root is doing, but you know, for NFT marketplaces, just given that there are a lot of bids there and a lot of, a lot of capital that is locked. So as we understand it, the there's a couple things. One is that Root is working on a couple of different products. The first is a, I mean, well, not the first, because they've already got BIP24. They've got the Root token. But one of the, the next things that they're working on, as we understand it, is a, a fork of Seaport. And Seaport is generally a way for uh, two parties to reach an agreement to exchange basically arbitrary assets. And that includes NFTs. So not sure on the pseudo swap uh, style of it, although don't think that's excluded based on the way that it's being implemented. It should be sufficiently generalized. But the concept is that that should already that should already be a part of the seaport fork, but that is with off-chain orders. Now, another question is how to have an NFT marketplace with on-chain orders. And for what it's worth, uh, I think that, and maybe here I'm misspeaking, but as I understand it, Root is also working on uh, a similar uh, concept but with on-chain storing of orders. And that, that should probably encompass an, 721 tokens. I, it would certainly expect it to encompass 721 tokens, but the question is whether it would do so in such a fashion that you can bid for a whole class of NFTs, and I don't think you would be excluded from that. So it should probably, that idea should probably already be in development because, and I think this really speaks to building generalized tech if the the tech that's built on beanstalk really is uh the most generalized that it can be a lot of these use cases are covered by high quality generalized on-chain development so uh, i think that a lot of this uh, a lot of the nft marketplace idea should already be in development as a subset of what root is working on to implement on-chain betting Thank you for that answer. Uh, and that was the last idea uh, that I wanted to discuss. We can, we can give it um, a few more minutes uh, if anyone has any other question before we end this class. Miao Miao asks, why do you think on-chain betting hasn't taken off with other projects? Not enough liquidity or bad spread or other reasons? On-chain betting is a microcosm, or the, maybe we should say the problem facing on-chain betting, or a microcosm of the problems facing DeFi in general, which is that you have non-competitive carrying costs for on-chain assets. So if I want to make a, a betting market, a prediction market, off-chain versus on-chain, on-chain prediction markets, businesses that are making those markets simply cannot compete because of the cost of capital because of the cost of liquidity. And therefore, there's simply not enough liquidity. So we, we, we think that fundamentally, Beanstalk is designed to solve that problem specifically. And it creates a, a currency that you, you receive interest just for holding it. And therefore, the, there is capital that there's no opportunity cost for using it within these prediction markets or any market. So you're collecting the interest from Beanstalk. There's no longer an opportunity cost associated with uh, the carry that you're potentially forgiving elsewhere uh, or giving up elsewhere. And I think that's really the cause or the crux of the, the, problem, uh, the problems across, across the board. Why is there no adoption of any of this tech? We think it's primarily carrying costs. And so from our perspective, prediction markets are just one of the things that should and will hopefully be built on top of Beanstalk. And when we say on top of Beanstalk, we really mean to support the silo and potentially also the field because the silo isn't, and it doesn't support it. it supporting the silo isn't, there's no ERC standard for the silo at the moment. 
and therefore having technology that accepts deposits and allows for them to be used, that's really the main difference. So if, if you can start to use your deposits in all of the current things that DeFi has, we think it, it probably will start to get adopted. And then to be perfectly frank, we're not interested in copying what other people are doing. We're interested in building things that are way, way better. So we go back to you know, what we were talking about with NASDAQ's idea for this NFT marketplace. If you build sufficiently generalized on-chain tech, it's going to cover a lot of the use cases that you want covered. And then if it's integrated with Beanstalk already and integrated with the silo in particular, that really should facilitate a wide variety of utility for beans and use of DeFi because now you don't have this liquidity problem. So I think that Root is hopefully going to be a proof of concept that lots of use cases that previously weren't profitable on chain, uh, now it actually is. Now, with that optimistic thing said, do think that there are a couple other real problems that face the face DeFi in general, uh, scalability is an easy one and, and transaction costs. But the other one that I think we've started to really pay attention to more and more is transaction ordering fairness. And in particular, if you have some way such that in a trustless fashion, there's some guarantee that transactions are going to be ordered based on when they were sent, or, or if not sent, when uh, most of the nodes in the network receive the transaction, then that can actually take away a lot of the cost associated with slippage uh, or, or impermanent loss might be a better way to say it uh, for providing liquidity. So those are maybe the the main problems as we see it. There's the carry cost problem. That's the main problem that Beanstalk was tackling. Then you've got the scalability problem, which a variety of L2s and other 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 L1s are trying to tackle in a variety of different ways. And then you've got the transaction ordering fairness or the fair transaction ordering. And I think that's a less research problem as we understand it. There was a pretty good paper that we were directed to when we spoke to Arbitrum recently put out by uh, one of the founders of Arbitrum or maybe the founder of Arbitrum, not sure exactly. And that seems to at least start the conversation around fair transaction ordering. But otherwise, there's not too much that's, uh, that's been done on that front. I think it's very important. Thank you for that answer. And Miao Miao, if you have any follow-up to that, please uh, type it in the town hall chat. And type here that, will the prediction market draw from deposited liquidity in the silo, or would it be new deposits into the silo on the back end from another protocol? I think in theory, you'd like both, right? So people that have deposits can obviously use those deposits however they'd like in the prediction market. But then as well, you, you'd like other protocols to be able to, in a seamless fashion, use root. And so one of the things that we've, we've been working on uh, and, and should hopefully be ready for audit very soon is a generalized implementation of the depot and the pipeline uh, or pipelines. Uh, now it's just one pipeline. But the concept is that through the generalized pipeline, uh, other protocols should be able to use the farm to interact with other protocols, and that would include root. So in theory, that would, that would answer the second part of your question, which is whether new deposits into the silo from other protocols would be done on the back end. That should all be facilitated by a generalized depot and pipeline, and that, that also should be ready for audit in the not-too-distant future. Okay. Let's give it... One more minute, and I see Miyomi was typing maybe a follow-up question. Yeah, he, he's, just, uh, he's just thinking. So give it one more minute if any, anyone else has another question. Yeah, and maybe just, although I don't know how helpful this is, I appreciate, I think we all appreciate that there's excitement to get new, new code deployed and new products launched as soon as possible. But we really do feel like from a, an ethos perspective, it's much better to move a little bit more slowly and build things that are going to last, or even if they're not going to last forever, are, are going to be useful for a significant period of time. 
and can be iterated on top of and building things in a sufficiently generalized and gas efficient fashion that that's the case isn't the easiest thing to do and do want to give a huge shout out to all the back end engineers that are working on a, a ton of different stuff. And if you take a look at the GitHub, you can see all the different work that's being done, uh, the pull requests and, and the different things that are being worked on. There's a lot, a lot of work just to get Beanstalk to a place where it's truly interoperable and the benefits of on-chain composability are fully leveraged. And uh, even though certain more, more obvious features like uh, the gauge system or the on-chain governance being implemented again, or the wells are a little bit more in your face as uh, things that are needed or desired. We would just add that there's lots of other things that are also needed in order to get to a place where it's just an obvious decision for other protocols to use beans and or beanstalk. And from our perspective, it now really is unrelated to the bear market, really, now is the right time to be trying to do a lot of that work and think a lot of it's being done and being done at a, a, a really commendable pace by all of the backend engineers. So shout out to them. And, uh, I, you know, this, this perhaps is a little bit of a direct response to some of the, uh, the frustration that's been expressed by people that there's not a lot happening. I don't think we agree with that at all. So from our perspective, the, the the pace of development on and around Beanstalk is is orders of magnitude faster than it, it was prior to the exploit. And it's with a much leaner Beanstalk Farms team. Uh, Bean Sprouts really starting to chug and, 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 and output lots of different stuff. And Rome wasn't built in a day. So uh, we're, we're very enthused by all the work that's being done and all of the development. And just want to give a huge shout out as uh, the, the Beanstalk Farms BIP comes down to the wire and the Bean Sprout budget also seems like it's probably going to come down to the wire-ish, although it's doing better than the Beanstalk Farms BIP, uh, that from our perspective, we're, we're, we're thrilled with the work that everyone's doing and uh, really appreciate it. So uh, that's our two cents on the matter. Obviously, uh, you know, the DAO has to vote on, on, on whether they, they think it makes sense to continue to allocate funding uh, to Bean Sprout and Beanstalk Farms, but I think there's a ton of good stuff happening, and it, it probably would be a a shame if that development was uh, decelerated in any way because of a funding uh, funding issue. So, uh, yeah, I think enough said on that front. But but this is meaningful. Uh, totally agreed, and I guess can't complain from from a DAO that you know puts you to a high standards and and you know. Pushes, pushes you, I guess, uh, to get more and more. And speaking of that and of the BIPs, uh, once again, uh, you have BIPs that includes the budget and has also uh, a BIP from Ruit that's on the uh, fungible uh, BDV. Um, they're live, uh, the Immunify bug bounty program as well, which is a security uh, um, um, bounty program. And, and, and that is also um, important. Uh, I mean, they're all important. Um, they're live and would encourage everyone to to vote for them. Um, there are less than 24 hours uh, for some of them to to pass. Amira asks, what ha what steps happen or what happens if the BIPs don't pass? Publius, do you wanna do you wanna answer that? I mean, we don't really know, right? So it depends which BIPs. I think each of the BIPs not passing would mean something different for Beanstalk and. That's a bridge we'll cross if we get there. Uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I guess it's, it's never the end if a bit doesn't pass, even if it's an, maybe it is, but um, if it's if it's one but that you know, there is something to be said for there's something to be said. Sorry to cut you off, Mod, but if the DAO is just never going to pass another bit, and Beanstalk is never going to upgrade itself, because at some point Beanstalk's probably not going to make it. Right, Beanstalk's still not at the point where it's it's done and it's just going to run. And so, if this sends a become term problem that no BIPs are being passed, and even things like BIP twenty four, where it's an architectural upgrade and it's really non substantive from a model perspective and doesn't affect any users, and it's just an architectural upgrade to try to facilitate interoperability with other protocols, if th those things start to fail. Yeah, it's tough to know what the future for Beanstalk looks like. So 
this goes back to our, our comment from earlier in class around the, the nature of forks and how if you have these disagreements that perhaps it is better for the protocol to split as opposed to just dying entirely because it can't upgrade itself. Maybe it's better to have a split where one version just does nothing and it stays the same and the other version mints the beans and continues to upgrade itself and do, does lots of stuff. So who knows? We, I mean, we certainly have no idea how, how this is all going to play out. I think governance of Beanstalk is very much, I mean, perhaps it's maybe even a bigger question at this point than the economics of Beanstalk. Uh, and therefore, don't, don't think I, we have a good answer for what, uh, what's going to happen if, if, if these BIPs don't pass. So we'll, we'll see. I think uh, it's not unreasonable to expect uh, some of them, if they don't pass, to, um, to be reproposed, perhaps. Uh, but I don't know. This is, this is funky. But again, don't think it's a bad thing that the votes are coming down to the wire up either and don't want to be like fudding. You know, if, if these bips don't pass, Beanstalk is fucked. It's like, well, the Dow, the Dow has opinions and, you know, as of now, go with the Dow because that's the way governance is set up. So uh, I think this is a problem that will continue to improve uh, over time. And, and is a, these are just great data points for us collectively as we start to think about how should the governance system work in perpetuity or in the long run, at least. Uh, these are really fundamental examples or instances of problems that the DAO is going to have to solve. And yeah, it's not so cut and dry. Not so cut and dry. I guess we'll take it one, one bit at a time. Um, or, or, or in this case, five, five bips at a time. Yeah, one, one bip at a time. I think that's a... Uh, the next uh, Beethoven song it has to be a Jordan Sparks <laughs> a Jordan Sparks remix. Yeah, that that might uh, encourage or incentivize uh, uh, voting. All right, um, we're at the end of today's class. Thank you everyone uh, for joining and for those who um, ask questions or uh, or send them. Um, thank you, Publius, uh, as always, for taking the time to answer all of these questions. Uh, and we'll see you all uh, next week. Thank you, Mark.